Nothing makes people feel smaller, more incidental to the scheme of nature than a mountain. And now that people have discovered how mountains are created, their geology seems great beyond comprehension. The force, for example, that carved the summit of the Matterhorn into a gigantic spearhead was the weight of a pile of ice hundreds of feet higher than the highest alp. And to make the mountain required continents to collide. When moving continents push up mountains, they also push up metals, the materials by which humans transform themselves from pack hunting animals to creatures that could, among other things, fly to the moon. Continents drift because they are floating on molten rock something we on the top side only see when the land splits and lava spews out like blood from a wound. As the heat comes to the surface, it can concentrate molten metals into nearby cracks in the rocks to form seams of ore. And while the land pulls apart in one place, it piles up in another. Here, for instance, is how the Alps were made. If you reverse geology by 160 million years, back as far as the early days of the dinosaurs, you see a Europe that is mostly underwater. Then Africa moves north on a collision course. The ocean floor is pushed up, the seas recede, and the southern edge of Europe is jammed backwards. The resulting crumples, the Alps. Italy, Corsica, Sardinia are bent sideways, causing splits, eruptions, volcanoes. Then melting ice caps raise the sea once more to set the coastlines of Europe of today. And it was not just the map which was formed in this way. That crunch with Africa was also to shape the destiny of peoples. Pieces of Africa and the seafloor in between were shoved right up onto the European landmass. Dante Blanche, this mountain in Switzerland, is African. So are most of the mountains in Austria. The limestone, this light band of rock in this peak above Martigny in Switzerland, was formed like all limestones under the sea to the south of Europe. As Africa pushed up, it was folded on itself and dumped on the top of the granite mass of the continent. Amazing as this is, it's more interesting to humans that the same processes enrich the continental rocks with seams of metal. Tin, lead, silver, gold. Halfway up a cliff on Switzerland's Weisshorn, there's a clear boundary between European rock and former seabed. The upper rocks, the green ones, contain copper, distilled beneath an ancient ocean. It was concentrated by volcanic heat into ores, green malachite and blue azurite. It took humans the best part of their existence as a species to recognize the potential of these ores, but when they did, the graduation from the age of wood and stone was decisive and rapid. Humans were farmers then, and partial to low flat land, but metals were found in mountains. If the discovery was ever going to be made, it would have to happen where flatlands and mountains meet. These mounds in Bulgaria, called tells, are the remains of prosperous farming villages of 8,000 years ago. Nearby are seafloor rocks. One of the largest tells, called Karanovo, has now been excavated to leave a cross-section like a cliff. And as far as the nesting bee-eaters are concerned, a cliff is what it is.
But in fact, they are digging burrows among the broken pottery of a village, as a horizontal cross-section can reveal. When people first settled here and built these mud and wattle homes, they were farmers, the first farmers in Europe, an inventive, industrious culture with a curiously punctuated history. Their lives would carry on uneventfully for a few generations, and then some sudden catastrophe, earthquake, fire, would destroy everything. Then they would rebuild on top of the ruins of the past, starting another layer, a new chapter for future archaeologists to explore. Now, at the bottom level, they're lifting the dust off floors beside the oldest road in Europe. When Caranova was first settled 8,000 years ago, its inhabitants were farmers attracted here, perhaps drawn to settle in Europe, by the rich local soils. The huge potholes in the cobbled streets are the rubbish pits dug by later generations. That cliff, 36 feet high, contains 4,000 years of villages built one on top of the other. Not only did the Karanovans oblige the archaeologists by having periodic calamities and successive rebuilding, they gave each layer a distinctive marker. A new advance in the art of pottery. At the bottom is the first European model, plain terracotta. At the next level, useful new shapes appear. At the next, a fine black finish witnesses progress in firing techniques. Higher, and there's wonderful artistic expression. Higher still, and the potters are using burnished graphite. And something else happens. It's about 6,500 years ago, and Europe has entered a new age. Set in a handle made of chicken bone, this tiny awl made of copper. Behind the tell of Caranovo stand hills of oceanic rock. The farmers had known for centuries about the strange greenish rocks in those hills. They had even mined them here at Ibernar. But it wasn't until their control of fire had reached a certain sophistication that they discovered in the native copper found there very interesting property. By repeatedly heating and hammering it, you could make it into a new shape. Like a fine tool made from bone, it wouldn't break. A sharp copper awl could be used for stitching leather. In Europe, 6,500 years ago, the tool in most common use, the one the average man would have had on his belt, was probably the stone axe, which was used for practically any heavy-duty job, from tree felling to carpentry. Stone axes were hard to make, particularly when the hole for the handle had to be drilled by means of bows, bone, and sand. So, when coppersmiths made their next discovery and could make axes as if by magic, they gained even more prestige. Applying their skills with pottery, they used a container
to heat the metal. The stone axe could be a thing of beauty and a mark of prestige, but it now had a competitor. Copper, a soft metal, couldn't be made as sharp as stone, but hammered copper was sharp enough, and a copper axe had the beauty of novelty. And of course, was a greater status symbol. The demand for copper soon drew miners into other parts of Europe where only hunters had previously ventured, to the mountains. At Rudna Glava in Yugoslavia's Dinaric Alps, rocks that had started their existence on the ocean floor were dug out and carried down to the smelting hearths. Malachite veins, telltale signs of copper, were pursued deep into the mountains. The earliest mines were dug by building a fire against the side of the shaft, and then pouring cold water on the rock. This caused the surface to crack, and the stone could then be broken further with mauls. Pried out with antlers. And the best ore sorted by color. Copper transformed society in a way that can be seen among the farming villages beside the Black Sea. Here, archaeological layers pile up yard by yard for centuries with very little change, and then suddenly, a blossoming. Another metal appears and surpasses copper in value, if not usefulness. Recently discovered graves at Varna in Bulgaria contain the earliest treasure found in Europe. Gold ornaments may have been bartered for copper tools. Commerce was not new, but such treasures brought great status. This is no longer a simple agricultural society, and this chieftain, no farmer. The bracelet is made from a type of shell, spondylus, that isn't found in the Black Sea. It comes from the Aegean, and was probably traded by way of the Bosporus for this society's copper. This man died owning at least four pounds of gold. He was a powerful chieftain at the start of an age of new dimensions in rank and wealth. Copper tools from the mines of Rudnaglava and the smelting hearths of Varna and Karanovo were traded throughout what is now Bulgaria and then spread further. East to the steppes of Moldavia, north to the Carpathian Basin, Slovakia and the Baltic coast all the way to the Jutland Peninsula. Then, in the way of minerals ever since, the copper ores ran out. Most of the metal had been buried with its owners or traded away. Whatever, copper, the currency of prestige, was gone. That was five and a half thousand years ago, and a whole society may have collapsed because of exhausted mines.
After Africa had collided with Europe, created the Alps, and put sea bottom malachite in mountainsides, something else happened. Ice advanced from the north, covered the mountains, and began to carve them. As glaciers cut away the upper layers of rock, they laid bare lower sections of copper deposits. When the ice retreated, these ores could be found in the higher remote mountains, but the sulfur in them made them gray and metallic. They didn't look like malachite. People not only had to learn to recognize this as copper, but they had to learn to burn off the sulfur before smelting it. The green flame, in the end, was probably the giveaway. And in the new seams, they had found the occasional ore of arsenic. That coincidence, plus the inspiration of some unknown metallurgical genius, led to a mixture of copper and arsenic and a much better metal. Arsenic finally gave copper the cutting edge it lacked. It was in the Middle East that the first arsenical copper was smelted, and in the Caucasus that the new ores and the new technology met up, and the marriage gave birth to new tools by a new process. The two-piece mold. This brought a real advance to the concept of mass production. Molds could be made from a pattern and used again and again, and in them could be cast axes with a long cutting edge and a deeper shaft hole, axes for use in battle. Shinier, sharper than anything made of pure copper, not just symbols of power, but weapons of war. Tribes from the steppes north of the Black Sea they had achieved a new and remarkable mobility by domesticating the horse. Horses were the key to a wandering way of life, and in the Caucasus Mountains, a culture of coppersmiths now had rich mines and the skills to mass produce the finest weapons in the world. It was not long before the horsemen from the steppes discovered them and rearmed, they spread. They fought their way into Eastern Europe and as centuries passed, some groups pressed on into the Carpathian Basin. The horse and arsenical copper had brought a common culture from the Caucasus to the Danube. Since people had first arrived in Europe, the Danube, which cut through the barrier of the Alps to the center of the continent, was one of its main avenues for trade. Anyone who could hold a position along the main avenue was bound to prosper, and beside the Danube, about 500 years after the birth of the battle axe, this meant powerful chieftains who raised cattle and controlled river trade. When the new weapons began to appear in the cargoes, they adopted them eagerly and used them on each other. New weapons meant new defenses around settlements such as Vuchidal. A more belligerent society meant a rich one. Today, all that remains are their graves. But from hordes, lost or offered to the gods, we can at least tell the priorities of the day. In one horde lay 60 battle axes. Mass production on this scale provided wealth and prestige worth fighting for and could command the allegiance of neighboring tribes. Power came from expertise in metalwork, a warrior prince's dagger of gold. Copper was the currency of prestige, 
and the Vucidal princes got theirs, and thus their power, from the mountains of what's now Yugoslavia. The battle axe carried their culture all the way north to the site of present-day Prague. And there, the copper trade met another trade coming from far distant lands, trade in another metal, tin. Smiths already understood the concept of the alloy of mixing metals and had found that mixing copper with tin was even better than mixing it with arsenic. But tin didn't come from new mountains like the Alps. It came from the granite heart of an older Europe and from cultures as distant as the one in southern Britain, the one that was building Stonehenge. 300 million winters had eroded these mountains away and dispersed the veins of tin as nuggets in stream beds. Instead of being mined, the nuggets were scooped up with gravel, which being lighter, would wash away. And the thousand mile trade in this metal of many colors marked the beginning of yet another new era in Europe because tin and copper made bronze. It was 2500 BC and Europe's Bronze Age had begun with a continuation and intensification of the age old arms race. Men lived and died by the sword. And for the next 2,000 years, mounted warriors and warring tribes spent virtually all of the creative energy of Central Europe on warfare and ostentation. But in another part of Europe, the New Age brought an era of peace the Aegean Sea. The geological basis for cultures here was the stretching of the planet's crust. Layers of rock are tilted up and sometimes rise above the sea as islands. Even before Europeans had learned how to farm, there were mines here and people came in search of valuable minerals pushed up from the inside of the earth. On some volcanic islands, such as Milos, obsidian could be found. This is a volcanic glass with a color and molecular structure different for every volcano. But it has the common quality of being a very good raw material for stone blades and arrowheads. 13,000 years ago, obsidian collectors were voyaging to Milos in reed boats of a kind that were still being used in Corfu 50 years ago. Milos is part of an arc of volcanoes that define the southern boundary of the Aegean Sea caused by the same stretching that is pulling Crete southwards about four inches a year. The stretching has tilted the rocks of Crete higher and higher Mount Ida has risen enough to intercept the winds from the south and west. They bring snow and rain, which create forests and bring water to the valleys. In the Bronze Age, Crete's climate was even wetter. The island had thick forests of ash, alder, lime. The earliest poets wrote of many fountained Ida, the mother of wild beasts. Crete's first settlers arrived 9,000 years ago with cattle and seed corn. They regarded the rain as a gift from the gods and worshiped the mountains, perhaps for bringing the rain to their crops. Indeed, Mount Yuktas has the profile of a sleeping man. All of nature, clouds, springs, rocks, trees, were sacred and ruled by a goddess, Dictina.
In the Cretan scheme of life, humans inhabited the valleys, while the gods lived in the forests and on the mountains. The first communities on Crete were isolated from each other by ranges of hills and mountains that cut off their separate valleys. This made them as safe from competition with each other as they were from the mainland. And it was the fertility of these valleys, where there is still enough grain grown to feed the whole of Greece, that provided the foundation of the very first European civilization. Civilization, in its simplest form, is the organization of societies into communities supported by outlying farms. 4,000 years ago, the Cretan farmers built large ceremonial settlements, and in them were massive circular containers, almost certainly for storing grain, a surplus of grain. They would have held much more than the people who lived in the settlements needed. What were these giant centralized granaries for? In case the rains failed? Or had grain taken on a deeper significance? Certainly whoever controlled it had power. Great bronze saws were used to build palaces of limestone three stories high, like these on a contemporary mosaic. The fertility of the valleys was transformed through the currency of grain into the first European cities. And the sea itself was changed. It was still a barrier, a huge moat that allowed Crete to develop in splendid isolation. But thanks to one of mankind's quantum advances made about 4,000 years ago, the invention of the sail, it also became a medium of travel, of trade. In fact, it was easier to travel by sea than by land. Cretan civilization was only human, and the palaces, no doubt, were celebrations of the power and prestige of a priesthood. Nothing here resembled the grandiose megalomania of the pyramids or the defensive monuments of the East. No one could have held a Cretan palace against an angry populace. But at the center of every palace still lay power in the storage chambers. Perhaps Crete was easy to rule because a population of simple farmers was held in sacred awe. The palace priests certainly exercised authority over trade and economy as certainly as the pharaohs did in Egypt. At the palace of Knossos are lead-lined vats and hundreds of huge jars for olive oil, wine, and grain. And in time, the stock grew richer. Perfumed olive oil, fine woolen textiles, metalwork, stonework, and no doubt a sophisticated bureaucracy to keep track of it all. A seal established the palace ownership. But that wasn't enough. Some quartermaster had to keep records on clay tablets, and the first one to do it was probably the first person in Europe to write. The script is called Linear A, and it's never been deciphered. But these are obviously numerals. And it's known that this is the sign for wheat. In the way of bureaucracy that time had yet to honor, state archives measured and manipulated the fruits of the working man's labor. The main thing most people know about the first European civilization, the Minoan, is that its citizens were obsessed by the power of bulls. Bull cults had existed for thousands of years in the East, and the symbol of Knossos became the bull man, 
the Minotaur. In frescoes, athletes vaulted the horns of bulls. The men, perhaps sacrificial acrobats, were rendered in red. The priestesses were in white. When the Minoans reached the peak of their power, they had graduated from a society based mainly on farming to being masters of trade, trade that flourished because of their singular craftsmanship and also because Crete was the right-sized island in the right place at the right time. To keep command of that trade meant maintaining the freedom of the waves with a powerful fleet. From palaces like Knossos, Minoan culture and trade radiated from Crete to all the shores of the Eastern Mediterranean. And the riches of the known world flowed back to the priests of the Minotaur and the lords of the Labyrinth, which was named after the second symbol of Knossos, the double-headed axe, or Labris. It was mounted between the symbolic horns of the sacred bull. As the political and religious power of the rulers of the palaces increased, the palaces themselves increased in magnificence. Life grew more and more luxurious, rituals more extravagant, and the priesthood more obsessed with the metaphysical. It was still the great goddess of nature whose rituals were observed, now as the goddess of snakes. But then the crust of the earth did what it had always done, it moved. Santorini, or Thera, erupted. It was only one incident in the story of the continual stretching of the Aegean floor, but it was also the greatest eruption of historical times, dated recently at 1628 BC. It converted a mountain into a huge flooded crater, and about that time, the Minoan civilization collapsed. Today, a wisp of smoke remains, and underneath the lava on the side of the volcano, a Mediterranean town that was obliterated, Akrotiri. Now, little by little, being dug up again. These storage jars for grain, now turned to carbon, were covered by 32 yards of pumice. Thera had entombed a refined culture, exquisite frescoes of African antelopes. A young fisherman with his catch. This greatest of all historical explosions took place just 75 miles from Crete. But did it cause the fall of Knossos? One long-held theory was that the falling ash buried the Minoan crops and brought a terminal famine. 
But though the ash fell a yard deep on roads and smothered Asia Minor, only a few inches touched eastern Crete. Was it tidal waves, tsunamis? They would have been huge, but did they destroy the palaces? Kato Zakros, the palace nearest sea level, is at the eastern end of the island. There's no sign of giant waves here. They seem to have been directed to the west and missed Crete entirely. But one thing does appear to have happened to all the palaces that have been excavated. One thing at the same time, a sudden end of the Minoan civilization. There wasn't a drenching from the sea, quite the opposite, but final just the same. In the ruins of all the palaces, you can find a black layer of cinders, and above that, the ruins of tumbled walls. The palaces were all burnt down, and Thera is too distant to have been the cause. The volcano wasn't the culprit, and this contemporary pottery proves it. After Thera's eruption, this new style came into fashion. And 50 years on, the labris, or the double-headed axe, was still in place. So what happened at Knossos in the 16th century BC? One of the purposes of mythology can be to transmit history. The myth of the Minotaur from the rising Greek culture maintained that every year the Minoans demanded from the town of Athens seven young men and seven maidens to be taken to Knossos and fed to the Minotaur. One year, Theseus, son of the Athenian king, demanded to go with them. But Ariadne, the daughter of King Minos, fell in love with Theseus and gave him a spindle of wool to thread his way in and out of the labyrinth beneath the palace. She also gave him a sword. found his way to the lair of the Minotaur. With the Minotaur dead, the lovers escaped as Knossos burned. The myths from the ancient civilizations long preceded modern archaeologists who have often been surprised by the discoveries that give the myths at least symbolic credence. In the records of the rebuilt palace of Knossos, they found a new kind of writing, which they called Linear B. But when it was translated, they found it was in Greek. The burning of the palaces preceded a new dynasty, new rulers who continued to have a bureaucracy that continued to record herds and wool and spinning and weaving, but in Greek. These Greeks, warriors of the mainland, came from the fortress town of Mycenae that dominated Athens. They were the Mycenaeans. Maybe Thera had been a factor in the downfall of the Minoans in that the infallible rulers had been terminally embarrassed by failing to predict it. Maybe the tidal wave sank the Minoan fleet. Maybe the Mycenaeans had led a revolt against a hated Minoan priesthood. Maybe no one will ever know. But it is one of the greatest unknowns of history, and it is certain that people will continue to speculate. And here is where the speculation begins. The grim ruins of Mycenae that lower above the fertile plain of Argos. In 1876, Heinrich Schliemann, the discoverer of Troy, retrieved Mycenae from the darkness of Greek prehistory when he found this great stone circle and cut into its bedrock 
royal graves full of gold. The king who bore this gold mask died before Knossos fell. This was the sumptuous horde of a warrior race. The tradition that began with the magical battle axes of the Caucasus had made Mycenae rich in gold. The heirs of the fierce horsemen of the north who wined and dined behind these ramparts had now triumphed over the whole Aegean. For about a century and a half, the Mycenaeans traded from Troy to the Tiber. It is likely that it's they who won the Trojan War. But then a dark age began. From about 1200 BC, the Mycenaean fortresses one by one began to fall. In fact, the whole population of the region crashed. There'd been another eruption. In 1150 BC, in Iceland, the volcano Hekla exploded with such violence that its ash darkened the entire northern hemisphere. The European climate, already cooling, cooled faster. Glaciers advanced, forests retreated, lakes rose, peat bogs grew. Mediterranean olive trees died of frost. Perhaps it was a volcano that caused a dark age in the Aegean. In the turbulence of the following centuries, the Greeks even forgot how to write. Their later lament was that an age of gold had been lost to an age of iron. Geology is oblivious. It destroys as easily as it creates. The continents were still colliding, the Alps still rising. The process of making new materials for new ages still going on. Greece would rise again on the resources of the Mediterranean, and someday, Northern Europe would too. Imagine if you could solve any secret, what would it be? Imagine if you could relive a time, where would you go? These are the untold stories. Just imagine a quest in search of history. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 9 Pacific on the History 